All right, thank you very much, Rob, and, and thank you all for uh, spending a little time with us this afternoon. Uh, hopefully, this will uh, well provide you with some good information on selecting and planting uh, the fruit trees and berry plants. And uh, some of you have probably already placed your order uh, for bare root uh, trees with us. Uh, if, if not, and if you are a member, uh, you can still purchase some of these bare root trees. Uh, we, we currently have a few apples and a few Asian pears and a, and a few uh, European pears left. And uh, as we go through the presentation today, uh, we will talk about uh, many of, of these varieties. So let me get oriented here and all right, let's begin. So um, first off with, with any, any uh, really any vegetable or, or fruit plant, uh, it, it's kind of uh, very important to uh, look at the site. Um, and we'll go over what that means. We will go over what the varieties mean and, and how we go about selecting our varieties here at Kansas City Community Gardens and, and the Giving Grove. Uh, we'll talk about uh, buying fruit plants and, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the planting, but we're really not getting into that too much. We will be having workshops on uh, fruit tree maintenance and, and pruning uh, in, in the next few weeks. So first off, uh, when it comes to site selection, uh, really with, I would say 95% of the fruits that we grow around here, full sun is, is definitely preferred. And full sun can also mean something like, you know, six to eight hours of sun. Eight is preferred, full day is certainly preferred. Um, and I'll tell you that morning sun has a better value than afternoon sun. And the reason behind that is morning sun burns off the morning dew. And it, it can sometimes be that morning dew that actually will lead to uh, different fungal infections on, on either your foliage or your fruit. So, so when thinking about uh, situating a fruit tree in your yard, think about that morning sun being the most important. Air, moving, air movements is also incredibly important. Uh, anytime you can get wind through the tree, through the canopy, that is going to also deter fungus. It can also deter frost. Uh, light, light winds uh, uh, can help uh, so the frost does not settle on, let's say, a, a blossom or a newly uh, formed fruit. Uh, also, sloping land provides for good air movement. You think about cold air settling and hot air rising. If you're on a slope, you get that transference of air. So that creates good air movement. And then, uh, of course, good drainage. Um, there are really, really no fruit trees like to have waterlogged soil. Um, there are, are, are very few plants that like waterlogged soil. There are wetland plants and wetland adapted plants. Most, uh, most fruit trees are not that. And then uh, soil structure is, is incredibly important. Uh, of course, you know, we have what we have here uh, in the Kansas City area, which uh, can be a lot of clay, although there are some nice loamy soils around here. And these fruit trees well grow in clay but you'll just want to make sure that you amend your soils a little bit with compost at the time of planting. And compost really, really helps break up clay. So can't, uh, can't underemphasize uh, the role of compost in planting. And then soil fertility. And uh, most of our soils are, are fertile enough for planting trees um, and fruit trees you know, they, they like between a 6.5 and a 7.5 on the pH scale. And most of our soils, while they might be a little bit alkaline, uh, are, are right around that. So when we're talking about some of the plant characteristics uh, in selecting fruit trees, uh, uh, we like to have disease resistance. And we'll talk about what that means uh, as we go through sort of fruit by fruit. 
Um, you want production, of course, that's why you're planting fruit trees. In some cases, you want storage life. Uh, you, you want an apple that's uh, going, to, going to still be firm in, 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 uh, in the crisper for three or four months. We'll talk a little bit about rootstock and, and how uh, it, it is there not only to help dwarf the tree, but also to adapt uh, the, the tree to the surrounding soils. Talk about what pollination requirements are. Some plants are self-fertile. Some plants need a separate variety in order to produce fruit. Blooming time and ripening dates, those are also important. And then there's sort of the general ease of maintenance. Um, growing fruits is, is one of the harder things you can actually uh, grow out there in sort of the horticultural gardening world. Uh, so anytime you can make uh, growing fruits easier, it's, it's going to be a win. So a little bit about pollination requirements. Um, so uh, apples, you definitely need two distinct varieties in order to get an apple crop. Now, in some cases, uh, crab apples serve nicely as a pollinizer, as a pollen source for an apple. Uh, the, the thing about crab apples is they, they have a long bloom time. And so the bees are moving between the crab apple and let's say the solitary apple variety that you have. Uh, pears and Asian pears, uh, you generally need two varieties. There are a few exceptions to that. Um, so, but generally in order to get large cropping, uh, for pears and Asian pears, you need two varieties. Peaches, they are self-fertile. So you could plant one peach and guess what? The bees will just find those flowers and, and you don't have to have another peach around. You don't have to have that pollen transferal. Uh, cherries, uh, all tart cherries are self-fertile. So you could just plant one of those. And some sweet cherries, some sweet cherries are salt fertile, but that's as you're going through the plant catalog, uh, they, those plant catalogs will tell you which is salt fertile and, and which needs a pollinator or pollinizer. Uh, plums, you generally need two varieties, but plums are a little complicated, we'll discuss later. Uh, jujubes, you need two, and pawpaws, you would need two. So some other pollination uh, considerations uh, are, are the blossom time. So you now good weather will encourage bees. Well, we can't do much about that, can we now? I mean, sometimes sometimes uh, mid-April or, or late March when our fruit trees are flowering, it's 55 degrees. And quite honestly, the honeybees are, are still in the hive. Um, but if you have other pollinators around, um, be they some of the native pollinators like orchard mason bees, some of the solitary bees that, uh, that are more acclimated to those cooler temperatures, you can get good pollinization. Uh, late frost can damage the blossoms. So the past two years, we have seen that uh, with, with Asian pears, European pears, and actually peaches. Uh, so, uh, some parts of the metro, we haven't had good fruit crops because of either late frosts or in the case of last year, we had deep, deep cold temperatures and then we ended up having a snow in mid-April. So um, yeah, those, those frosts just after pollination, they can damage the fruit. Um, and then, you know, the pollen germination, that's kind of what I said earlier, is you need those, those warmer temperatures to induce good, good pollinization. So, but that, some of those things are a little bit out of our control. So we like to select varieties that are late blooming. So some other considerations with the uh, variety selections, uh, the fruit quality and characteristics. You know, uh, some people like tart apples, some people like sweet apples, uh, some people want apples for processing, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll talk about some of that. 
We kind of talked about some of the pollination requirements. We'll get into the weeds a little bit more on that. Uh, bloom time, root stock, and disease resistance. And disease resistance is definitely a big one when we're when we select our fruits here and, and all of the fruits that we have for sale through, the, uh, through our fruit tree sales have a good disease resistance profile. So we talked about this a little bit. Um, and what I wanna get into actually on, down here is on the plums. So uh, the fact is that uh, plums, because we have so many different hybrids and so many varieties, it can be complicated. Plums, you have Japanese plums, you have American plums, and you have European plums. And then you have hybrids between all of those. So making sure you get the right type of plum that serves as a pollinator is very important. And in some cases, there are plums that are self-fertile. So understanding what that means is incredibly important. So a little bit about uh, rootstocks and dwarfing rootstocks. Um, almost all fruit plants, with the exception of a lot of shrubs, uh, have been grafted onto a rootstock. And the process of grafting is you're taking the shoot of the variety, let's say it is enterprise apple, and you're taking that shoot and cutting it and then attaching it to a root stock. And that root stock is there, so one, you can continue propagating that plant because apples aren't grown from seed. A lot of fruits are not grown from seed. And then the other thing is uh, that root stock can, can dwarf the size of the, the plant. So if you were to grow an apple, it would be a 30 to 35 to sometimes 40 feet tall. So having a root stock that dwarfs the tree is nice. It brings it down to let's say 18, 15, even 12 feet. At 15 and 12 feet, those trees become really pretty manageable. The other thing is that that rootstock uh, is, can, uh, is adapted to our soils. And in some cases, the rootstock has been bred to be resistant to certain diseases that are either airborne or soil borne. So when you're purchasing your trees, it's nice to make sure that, that the rootstock is identified. Um, that can be a little bit more difficult as, as you go out there into the nurseries and um, and into the big box stores. But there are a number of online nurseries that do identify their rootstocks and we identify the rootstocks uh, that, that we sell here. So when buying fruit trees, um, there, there are some important considerations. Um, you know, buy the variety you want, <laughs> first off. And, and not just what's available. You know, sometimes it could, be, it could be really enticing to see some of these fruits that are there and, and uh, you, you, want to, you just wanna purchase it because it's the right price and it says peach on it. Well, that, that may not always be the, the best bargain for you. Uh, so uh, think about that and think about uh, the fruit tree as a very much a long-term investment. Uh, these are crops that are going to be growing for more than 10 years, more than 15 years. You know, we're talking 20, 30, and in some cases, 40 or 50 years. So, so you really need to think about that too. Now, as far as kind of what's out there on the market, um, so uh, we uh, sell bare root trees every spring through the fruit tree order. And basically it's something that comes in at about four to five feet tall and it is bare root, meaning these trees have been dug up from a, from a nursery. Uh, they've been planted at about two feet on one to two feet on center and they get uh, mechanically dug up in the fall. They get, uh, they get sorted and graded and then they get shipped to us uh, bare root. Uh, other styles are, 
are the bald and burlap, which you rarely see anymore. You see that more in shade trees. And then there are container um, uh, grown trees. And container grown trees are how probably uh, most of you have planted trees in the past. So a little bit about container grown. Container grown, it, it actually, it makes it nice and easy, uh, quite honestly. It's, it's something that uh, you, can, you can pick it up from the nursery, you can take it home, you can pull it out of the pot and you can plant it. And it also allows for you to plant it when the tree is in full leaf. Um, however, the danger of container grown trees and shrubs is they'll get uh, these spiraling roots. And so this, this can definitely be a problem when, you're, uh, when it comes to planting time. So all of these roots are spiral, spiraled around. And if you do not actually kind of tease those roots out a little bit, in some cases, the tree roots will just continue to grow in that spiral. They won't get out into the existing soil and uh, eventually the tree will suffer and it, it could die rather quickly. Uh, the other thing is because they're kind of still wrapped in that, that can, that pot type shape, uh, they, they aren't anchored in the ground so they blow over really easily. So um, while there are some distinct advantages to grow, uh, growing and planting trees uh, in nursery pots, you just want to make sure that when you pull the tree out of the pot that you try to tease those roots out. And in some cases, you end up root pruning the tree so it starts establishing a different root system, not one that has spiraled. Now here are our bare root trees and, and kind of how we handle them. So, so basically the way we get them, and if, if you get a tree from us, it'll be the way you get it. So we, we get these trees, uh, they're, they're shipped in boxes that are six to seven feet long, about uh, uh, 18 inches uh, deep and wide. And uh, they, they come all bundled together. They have a little bit of uh, peat or, uh, or newspaper, wet newspaper wrapped around them. And uh, so we get them in and we put them in a cooler right away. Now, um, then after that, uh, they'll get separated out and kind of repacked. But then when you get your bare root tree, what you'll want to do is you'll want to open it up, make sure the roots are moist, uh, keep as cool as possible. Um, so let's say you get it home and, and you're not ready to quite plant it, make sure that you have it uh, in the shade or on the north side of your house, uh, someplace where it's just not going to be exposed. And then uh, prior to planting, it's, it's always recommended to really soak the roots. And the reason being there is some roots may be a little dry, uh, but by soaking those roots, um, that wakes up the root system and the tree can, can start basically the process of, of getting acclimated. So now there's uh, sort of digging the hole. And this is something, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but uh, there is a kind of a right way and a wrong way to dig a hole. In general, most of our holes uh, when we plant bare root trees are going to be kind of 12 to 16 inches deep. A lot of people think, oh, I, I need to dig a three foot deep hole. No, no, you only need to dig the hole as deep as uh, the root layer is. And, and the root layer is actually uh, the top root uh, of, of that tree. But what you do want to do is you want to dig a wide hole. And the thing about digging a wide hole is that will help ensure that you have loose enough soil for those roots to get outward. So you also want to make sure that the graft, and we talked about how all of these are grafted, that the graft is above, above the soil line and at least two to six inches uh, above that soil line. And then one thing that we like to do when we dig holes um, is we actually like to start in the middle 
of the hole when we're digging. So down here, imagine that's the, the hole, the blue. And we start in the middle. And then as we dig out the middle, we work to the outside. And where those, those white dashed lines are, that uh, is, represents the shovel. So that shovel gets turned perpendicular to the outer edge of the hole. Now what that does is that actually breaks up the outer edge of the hole. Imagine as you're uh, digging a hole and you rock back on the shovel as, as you dig the hole, what happens to the backside of the soil where the backside of the shovel and the soil interface that compacts the soil. So by turning your shovel, this helps alleviate that compaction. It's, it's sort of a, a, a different way of digging the hole, uh, but it actually helps alleviate compaction. And that's what you need to get a tree established. So here's a, a little kind of visual. Um, you'll, you'll see there's the, there's the bare root going in. And there is the bare root once it's actually in the ground. So here are kind of a few, few of the, uh, the handling and the planting steps. Uh, so really, you know, get the tree in the ground kind of as, as soon as possible. Uh, so you, you, take, you take shipment of it, uh, you, you bring it home. If it's a, if it's a good day, uh, you know, 50, 60 degrees with, uh, you know, and, and the soil is not too wet because uh, soil that's too wet will just be compacted. Um, uh, then go ahead and start digging and, and do that digging at the proper depth, uh, the proper width, set the plant at the proper height. And that's the other, uh, the other thing we talked about making sure this, this, uh, that the, the crown right there, that crown and root flare is going to be at the, at the top of the hole. So then you set that at the proper height. You actually put a little bit of a, a cone of soil below these bare roots because these roots are going to flare out. They're going to flare out in all directions. And that cone of soil will help all of those roots sit on top and get those roots flared out. Then you start just filling in with soil. And most of the time, you just end up using the native soil that you have, the soil that you've dug out of the hole. You don't want to throw any of the grass back in. You just want the soil. Throw in some scoops of compost, uh, because especially if you have uh, heavy clay, that compost will really help break up that heavy clay. And then you end up mulching and watering. And uh, as you are uh, as you are doing all of this, don't tamp or compress the soil with your feet. I don't know how many times, how many times, how many times I have seen people do this, and I and, and it's like they're they're trying to kill a bug or something. They're just smashing it down. That's you know what that does. That's breaking roots and that's compressing the soil. So so please. Uh, as you're planting a tree, do not do that. Resist the urge. Uh, and then finally, there is ring mulching. And uh, mulch is something that uh, can't say enough good things about it because uh, what mulch does is it will, will help keep, uh, keep uh, the, the, the tree kind of nice and evenly moist. Uh, it keeps the weeds and the sod uh, away from the, the root system, which uh, any, any weeds uh, uh, or grass or sod, uh, that will help compete for the resources, so the, the nutrients and the water. Um, and the thing is, you want to avoid uh, what is the mulch volcano or the mulch cone and, uh, that's mounted all the way up against the trunk uh, you want to have more of a mulch, uh, mulch donut around the tree. So these mulch cones, uh, the problem is all of that wood is up against the trunk of the tree. And what happens, especially on, on, on young trees, young trees have more tender bark and that wet mulch 
will start to kind of rot away and also make sort of a more hospitable area for a lot of insects to get into the tree. So please, when you mulch, make sure that you're, you have the mulch around the root ball and around that whole area where you dug, but not right up next to the trunk. And then this is just a little thing. When you get new trees, little small maintenance tips, uh, sometimes you might need to uh, head back the tree. We will talk about this extensively when, uh, when we have our pruning uh, workshop, which will be, I believe, that's uh, sometime in March, early March. Uh, we'll also talk about this a little bit with our, our fruit tree maintenance workshop, which is coming up in two weeks. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, this is just a little bit of a primer right now. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot more to learn. And believe me, you will wanna learn this if you're getting into fruit trees um, because you'll wanna learn about proper branch angles. You'll wanna learn about when to prune, what to prune and why to prune. Uh, if your branch angles are, are too tight, uh, the, the branches are weak and, and the trees will break. Um, so, and then certain plants like peaches, they need to be pruned a certain way in order to maximize production. And, and what this slide actually tells you is you may end up do, doing a lot of pruning uh, kind of early on. Uh, because if, if you look at the, at the first one here, this is pretty much, you get the tree and the tree looks like this. Well, you don't want the tree to continue to look like that because if it were to keep growing straight up, you would have a, a very compacted canopy, which would not allow for good sunlight and airflow, and then you wouldn't get good fruit production. So you end up, you end up heading back the tree in order to create these scaffold branches. And there's a lot of lot of stuff going on here. It's complicated. I recommend uh, attending the, the next two workshops in regards to fruit trees. So let's get into some of these varieties. And here we are with the, with the apples. And so basically with, uh, with the apples that we choose around here, because there are hundreds, there are thousands of varieties of apples out there. Apples have been grown for millennia. So, uh, and, and different varieties have been selected. There have been hybrids. And the, so there's a lot out there. And there's a, a lot of research goes into breeding apples. Anymore, a lot of the, uh, the research goes into trying to breed disease resistant apples. And so that's, uh, that's we are selecting these, these disease resistant apples that have been bred over the years. And the criteria there is uh, we wanna have good resistance or immunity to apple scab, which is a fruit rot, uh, which actually, uh, well, just kind of ruin all of the apples on your tree. So all of the varieties that we offer and recommend have good apple scab immunity or resistance. Same with cedar apple rust, which is a foliar disease, which can sometimes infect the fruit. Um, same with powdery mildew, which is uh, more of a foliar problem, can infect the fruit, and also with fire blight. And fire blight is something that can actually uh, affect the whole tree and end up killing the whole tree. So we want to have resistance to all of these things. It, it just makes growing the fruit that much easier. And so it, it's these varieties here uh, that we recommend uh, uh, based on those criteria. And, and, and some of these uh, we, we are offering in the fruit tree sale, and currently we still have a few pristine and liberty left, um, but all of these are, are good varieties uh, that have a good disease resistance profile. Uh, the Williams Pride is a red, that is July, uh, pristine, which is probably my favorite early season apple, oftentimes right by July 4th. 
uh, nice and crisp and golden. That's what's here in the inset is uh, that, that, that gold with a blush. That is a pristine apple there. Uh, some of the mid-season ones are, are Red Free and Liberty. And actually the photo below is of Liberty. Liberty offers a, a really, uh, really good flavor. It's kind of complex, a little tart, a little spicy, a little sweet. Um, and then there are the season apples, uh, Enterprise and Sundance. Uh, Enterprise, I will tell you, is probably, <clears throat> probably the easiest, most foolproof apple to grow. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good grower. Uh, they call it grower friendly. And they, they will get really uh, nice, large, large apples. So sometimes, uh, sometimes up to a pound in size, which is really large for an apple. <clears throat> so here we are with uh, European pears. And, and uh, we like to grow uh, pears around here because pears actually have less insect pests than uh, apples. And, and so both European and Asian pears do grow very well around here. Now, the, uh, the thing is, uh, we, are, we are looking on European pears, we're looking for good fire blight resistance. That is really one of the main criteria that, that we're looking at. And, and so uh, with these, um, uh, Haro Delight is a, is a really nice one. It's the earliest ripening pear uh, for our area, and it's uh, typically uh, the third week of July uh, has a has a very large ripe crop of fruits. Uh, uh, precocious means that it starts bearing at, at a somewhat early age, which is a desired quality to have in European pears because uh, with some European pears it can take a little while before before they start coming into full production. You know, you're you're looking at maybe five years after planting, five six years on some, you know, to even get a partial production. Uh, Haro Delight uh, comes into full production really after year five and six. So Blake's Pride is another good one. It's an uh, August ripener. Uh, Honey Sweet, uh, another good August ripener, and then. Uh, Warren, which is actually a uh, self-fertile, uh, well, honey sweet is also partially self-fertile, but Warren uh, is, a, is a really nice, strong grower um, and self-fertile. And Potomac uh, is a very uniform, strong grower, however, is not self-fertile. Asian pears, uh, we, we do like them a lot. And I see, I forgot to put Shinko on the list. That's, uh, well, that's all right. Shinko is another good one too. Uh, so uh, Asian pears, we have a number of them planted here at the, uh, at the, at the shop and, and in the beanstalk garden and the new orchard uh, uh, attached to the beanstalk garden. So uh, all of these are, are great varieties. The, the thing with Asian pears is you want varieties that uh, are not as susceptible to fire blight. So I was talking about fire blight earlier, getting into apples. Well, it's also something that gets into Asian pears and European pears. And Asian pears, especially when young, can be a little bit more susceptible to fire blight. But all of these varieties here and Shinko, I, I should say, um, have shown for us good fire blight resistance. There's a lot of uh, a lot of different research around different parts of the country into fire blight resistance, and uh, it's it's kind of all over the place. Um, so I, I think Asian pears, uh, there there needs to be a lot more study done on fire blight resistance. But this is what has worked well for us. And Shinsui, we have a, a nice, uh, a nice large one out here at the shop. Uh, it is a once again a very early pair, uh, and has just proved to be uh, have good fire blight resistance and has a wonderful sweet, juicy texture and taste. Uh, it is like sweet water. 
Uh, Tojuro has been here in the Beanstalk Garden since the, uh, I think the early to mid 2000s. Uh, and it throws off pretty reliable crops. It is perhaps uh, the, the sweetest, most butterscotchy of, uh, of the Asian pears. And then Yoanashi uh, is a one that ripens a little bit after Chojuro. Uh, after Yoanashi would be Shinko. And then Korean Giant is the last one to ripen. And uh, these pears can be giant. They are, uh, they are a pound uh, if, the, if the fruits have been properly thinned. So now peaches, and I think uh, everyone likes a peach. I, I don't think I've met anyone yet who doesn't. Um, so uh, peaches, we can grow peaches really well, well around here. Unfortunately, the past two years, uh, especially in, in areas, sort of the more rural areas outside of the 435 loop, um, the, the winters and or late frosts have, have actually uh, ruined any of the peach crops that, that could have happened uh, the past two years. But, but one of the things that we're always looking for in peaches, uh, we're looking not only for, for late bloom time uh, in order to escape that frost, um, which you know, we, we get frosts in mid-April all the time, but we're also looking for uh, hardiness, blossom hardiness, and, and sometimes it's, it's uh, fruit hardiness uh, to those frosts. And so if, if the peach has good blossom hardiness and good fruit hardiness in uh, mid-April mid when we get that frost, then it means that it can, and it can avoid that frost damage. And so these varieties that we like, uh, Harrow Diamond is uh, one that was bred out of Canada, and it, uh, it's one of the earliest peaches for us. Now, what it means to be an early peach, it means the fruits are going to be a little bit smaller because they haven't had as long of a time to, to be on the tree. Uh, but what it also means is that avo it avoids some of the pest issues that are associated with peaches. And peaches succumb to a number of different pests, being a soft-bodied fruit. They also succumb to tree borers, which is a whole separate issue. But uh, this, the Haro diamond avoids some of the fruit pest issues. And it can also avoid some of the fungal issues uh, that can be a problem with, with uh, peaches, especially stone fruits. Um, so things like brown rot. Uh, uh, brown rot, something that will can kind of take hold in peaches, plums, and cherries. And by having these early ripening ones like Haro Diamond, it avoids some of those things. However, it's a smaller fruit, so there's a trade-off. But then there are Red Haven and Contender, and uh, both of those are very much tried and true, uh, um, and they they do very well for our area. Um, they they have, all of these have pretty good uh, tolerance and or resistance to uh, bacterial spot, which can, can cause some problems on the fruit and on the wood and on the foliage of peaches. Um, the other thing about Red Haven is it has some natural resistance to peach leaf curl. And if you've ever grown a peach and you've seen the puckered leaves that uh, uh, they start to exhibit this, this uh, symptom in mid-April, mid to late April. Uh, Red Haven is one that while it, get, it still gets peach leaf curl, it doesn't get it that bad. So um, you say all three of these have very good attributes and some of them, some of them different attributes. By the way, they're all, uh, they're all a, a, a semi-free stone. Uh, which means that they, they end up separating from the seed fairly nicely. The Haro Diamond tends to cling a little bit more, but Red Haven and Contender um, are, are more of a semi-free. So on cherries, uh, there, are, there are definitely a, a lot of cherries to like out 
there and, and cherries do incredibly well around here. Um, so Montmorency is kind of your, your standard pie cherry. Uh, that's, that's the one that is grown in Michigan that uh, you know, it's, it's just kind of a famous old variety. Grows great. Uh, however, it's a it's tree form, and uh, so it can be large, you know, 12 to 15 to 18 feet tall. Um, but, you know, if, if you don't mind getting up on a ladder and picking cherries, it, it's definitely worth it. Uh, the It's got a uh, kind of yellowish flesh, and so, um, uh, you know, great, great for pies. Uh, North Star is uh, similar to Montmorency. Uh, same style of cherry, uh, that, that kind of yellow flesh, uh, red skin, uh, yet it is a true natural dwarf. So they will grow really no taller than about 10 feet tall, 10 feet wide. So that means there's a little less production. Uh, the fruits are also a little bit smaller. Now, one tree that uh, unfortunately we have sold out of this uh, this year already is the Jubelium, which is a hybrid between a sweet and tart cherry. Uh, these, these cherries have a very deep purple fruit. As a matter of fact, that is the bottom photo that you're looking at there is the Jubelium. So it's a, a deep red to purple fruit, uh, very large. Um, and they, while still being a tart cherry, uh, they they have a higher bricks, meaning a higher sweetness, and uh, they're they're just wonderful. And they're very good dehydrated. Um, so if it's if you can find that one out there on the market, I do suggest it. It does take a while to actually start fruiting, though. And then when it comes to sweet cherries, there are a lot of different sweet cherries out there. Uh, the the ones that we recommend are black gold which is, uh, it's basically a, a deep red, uh, red, almost purplish skin, but a yellow flesh. Uh, and they're a large cherry, the way most sweet cherries are. And then uh, Rainier is, is another cherry. And that's uh, basically, it, it does need a pollinizer. Uh, so you'll have to get either another sweet cherry uh, or, Oddly enough, uh, Montmorency, the, the tart pie cherry, can serve as a pollinizer for it. Now I want to talk about something that, uh, that we've uh, been selling here for a little while and I've had in the beanstalk garden, uh, plant around uh, all over the place with our Giving Grove orchards are the uh, Romance series of bush cherries. And these are something that have, have been bred over a number of years. They were initially uh, bred for the, uh, the very short season of, of Saskatchewan, a, a uh, climate zone two, which I believe that means they, they regularly get to negative 40. Um, but they, they actually grow quite well here in our Kansas City area. Nice thing is these are a shrub form. So you're not getting up on a ladder to do any sort of picking, uh, and they ripen at the same time as uh, as all of the other typical cherries. So there's just you know there's we we love them. Easy to pick, easy to prune. Uh, the other thing because they are on a shrub, and you have kind of lighter limbs, uh, so they, it's not like large limbs of a tree, you don't have as many birds get into the shrub. Now, do the birds still get to the cherries? Yes, they do, but it's not as much as if you were to have a tree cherry. So the inset here are the, uh, uh, this is Carmine Jewel uh, in flower, and we have a, have a whole row of these at one of our community gardens. Uh, we have them here at the uh, at the shop, and uh, we also have them at uh, have them at well, we have them all over the city. So uh, anyhow, a little bit about these. Carmine Jewel is is actually kind of the workhorse. Uh, frequently bears over twenty pounds a year, which is quite a bit of cherries when you think about it. Uh, but it's a smaller cherry, however, still very juicy. 
uh, the juice is uh, very red. So this isn't like a Montmorency. You now the Montmorency has a yellow juice, a yellow flesh. All of these in the Romance series have a red juice and a red flesh. And, and when you think about the sort of the, uh, the anthocyanins and the antioxidants, uh, you know, eating your colors, uh, this, this is a healthy juice right here. So uh, Romeo, which is also in, in the same series, uh, is a little bit larger of a fruit. So you'll notice 3.5 grams to 4 grams on Romeo and slightly sweeter than Carmine Jewel. And then we have Juliet, which is uh, another in the series. And this is actually the largest of the fruits and the sweetest of the series. Now, I, I will tell you that uh, both Romeo and Juliet, they, they actually don't yield as much as Carmine Jewel, uh, if you're just taking it on a shrub by shrub basis. Uh, however, uh, having those larger fruits makes for easier pitting and having a, a slightly sweeter fruit is, is also helpful. A little bit about apricots. Don't want to belabor this too much. Um, apricots, we we don't recommend them too much around here. Uh, normally, it's it's one year out of every seven, uh, maybe that you will actually get a crop of apricots. Uh, the problem being there is is most apricot varieties uh, are early blooming or we will warm up uh, a little bit too quickly and that'll instigate blossom for these apricots. They flower and then we get hard freeze, we get frost, we get snow, uh, the crop is lost. So it's not something that we can entirely recommend. We have a couple varieties here that uh, we're, we're still experimenting with um and have actually taken some cuttings off of a a annual producing apricot that has since unfortunately died uh that was growing here in the metro for a number of years so like i said it's it's kind of uh, uh it's the holy grail if one can find an apricot that produces year in and year out around here so plums and and i alluded to some of the 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 plum difficulties uh, earlier uh, that, that there, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of confusion uh, around plums. And if, if you're to, uh, if you're to go to a, a, a online and, and look at like One Green World or, uh, or Burnt Ridge, some of these nurseries, they can help unlock uh, the, the confusion there. But because you have European, you have Japanese, and you have American plums and all of the hybrids, it is confusing on what pollinates what, what is self-fertile. Um, and so you just need to do your research on that. Now, I, I will tell you that, um, uh, and this is from, from a lot of personal experience, uh, the American and the Japanese and the, Amer and the hybrids uh, within that uh, do a lot better than a lot of the European varieties. So when you think of, of European varieties, you're thinking of, of uh, uh, Damson and, and Green Gage and, and some of those plums. And the, the thing about some of those plums is they, they hang on the trees for a while, but they also, uh, they also have a lot of disease susceptibility and they get brown rot, just the, uh, which is something I alluded to earlier with the peaches. A lot of these, uh, the Japanese plums and American plums are also juicier uh, than the European plums. So as the, the varieties that, uh, that work reasonably well around here are, are Toka and Shiro, Methley and Ozark Premier. Methley and Ozark Premier are going to be sort of the, the, the larger, uh, juicier plums that you'll, you'll find in the supermarket, while both uh, Toka and Shiro are going to be a little bit smaller of a plum. And in some cases, like Shiro, a yellow plum, which is uh, you know, kind of unique in and of itself. Uh, Shiro, however, um, 
let's see, is, yeah, Shiro is, is not self-fertile. Um, so, and I don't believe, I think Methley might be the only self-fertile one on this list. So once again, you'll, you'll have to check with, with your vendor to find out what you need uh, pollination wise on these plums. Now we're getting into something more unusual, but not really because it is a native fruit, uh, the pawpaw, and, and come out here uh, to, to the site and you'll see we have uh, a few different selections of, of our, our largest native North American fruit uh, here in the Beanstalk Garden. Um, so these uh, you'll find in nature and here around Kansas City, uh, you'll find them around the Blue River, uh, really in, in kind of undisturbed hills and natural areas. Uh, they, they do grow all, all over. They are a Missouri native plant. They are native to most of the eastern half of the United States. But over the years, people have been selecting and, and uh, breeding these uh, to get larger fruits. Uh, because if you're to go out and forage these on some of our native stands, the, the fruits would be uh, somewhat small. They, they would be you know, a couple of ounces and they would be filled with seed. Uh, some of these larger uh, fruited varieties, uh, the fruits can be up to 10 to 12 ounces and they have less seeds. So therefore you're getting, you're getting more, more pulp. Um, this is a fruit that, that uh, very few people have tried. It's not something that you'll find in the supermarket because these have, a, have an incredibly short shelf life. And uh, as, as, they, as they sit on the shelf, they start to blacken and nobody would want to buy them. But they're very unusual. They have a, a taste that is uh, very uh, banana, mango-y, and a texture that is uh, very custardy. So um, these varieties here all do well around here. Uh, Missouri State has recommended the uh, Susquehanna and Shenandoah as kind of being the, the best growers uh, with the largest fruits. Uh, Pennsylvania Gold is there. There's, there's a selection from Kansas called Sunflower. And there's a lot of pawpaw breeding that is, is going on out there to kind of explore this, uh, this native North American fruit a little bit more. Another thing about this too is, um, so if you are going to plant pawpaws and while, that, while in nature they are an understory tree, they are uh, you know, under the oaks and hickories and cottonwoods in the woods. Um, but if you are to uh, get them established, Planting them in full sun is, de is definitely what you want to do because you will get more fruit. Um, however, planting one of these young trees in full sun can be uh, a little bit of a challenge because the leaves are so big, the leaves get beaten up by not only the wind but the sun. And so Early on during the establishment phase, the first two to three years of a pawpaw's life, it's suggested to have some sort of shade, uh, some sort of wind and shade mitigation, uh, be that uh, a screen or a teepee or something uh, over the tree to protect it a little bit from the harsh sun and wind. And once the tree is established, you can remove uh, remove that and the, and the tree can then handle full sun, full wind exposure. All right, persimmons. So that's, a, that's another one of our native North American fruits. Uh, however, there are also persimmons that are native, they're Asian native persimmons. There are Mediterranean native persimmons. So the bottom photo you'll actually see um, the difference between the Asian persimmon, which is the much larger, more oblong one, uh, as opposed to there's the American persimmon. So you have the, the, the Japanese persimmon is the larger, the American one is the smaller. But uh, persimmons, uh, of course, have been, been used uh, as a food crop for quite a long time. 
Um, but there's there's been a, a lot of persimmon breeding out there too to, to breed for much larger fruits. And uh, some of these varieties like Croc, Early Golden, and Garretson are, are some of the better, larger fruited persimmons out there. The other thing about persimmons I might want to add is, is uh, a lot of people uh, uh, think that, well, you need to wait for a frost or a hard freeze for the uh, persimmons to, to ripen. So that's, that's not true with all varieties of persimmons. And uh, some of these varieties, like early golden especially, uh, it will ripen as early as mid-August. And the thing is, at that point, the persimmon is soft. And if you look at this top photo, you'll see right where the fruit and the stem meet, there's what's called this calyx. And if the fruit separates from that calyx and the fruit is soft, then it will not have that, that astringency, that uh, the, the thing that causes extreme cotton mouth. Um, so uh, there are a lot of varieties out there that they do ripen early. And so that's, that's the other thing that persimmon breeders are looking at is, is uh, finding those, those large non-astringent early ripening varieties. And lastly, Nikita's gift is a hybrid between uh, both the native persimmon, the, the Diospyros uh, virginiana and the Japanese persimmon. And it is uh, definitely a much larger persimmon than any of these other uh, American selections. All of, all of these varieties do well around here. I know persimmons are a little bit of a, a niche crop, but, uh, but once you grow them, you can, you can definitely utilize them in a lot of different dishes. And here we have figs. Figs, I, uh, I, I don't consider too much of a, a a big food production crop for us around here. It's more of an unusual crop, but it's fun to have a fresh fig. And really around here, we treat figs more as a uh, shrub rather than a tree. Um, so the, the varieties that we, we recommend are, are Hardy Chicago, Peter's Honey, and Stella. And Hardy Chicago is, is the, the one that's on the inset here. Um, so it has this kind of kind of deeper purple fruit with a little bit of a uh, reddish flesh on the inside, and you know, and on a on a good year, you'll get maybe a hundred to a hundred and fifty figs. Um, now, if you take care with your figs, and and this is kind of a whole separate class, but if you if you really insulate your figs over the winter. Sometimes you could have a much larger harvest, but it does take a little bit more work. If anything, it's a nice unusual fruit that you can grow. With these, you have to have in the hottest part of your yard, the most full sun, et cetera. You know, consider this being a, a Mediterranean desert crop. And it, it kind of thrives on being thrown out there in full sun. And it's it's it, very necessary for it to start uh, putting on fruits. And then we have jujubes, uh, known as the Chinese date. So jujubes are uh, one that uh, we've been growing for a little while here, have uh, grown them out at Powell Gardens for a while too. Uh, this is a, a tree that um, so they put on fruits that are about the size of a golf ball and a little bit smaller. Uh, they're a very crisp fruit, but then, uh, then kind of a dry texture afterwards. However, they dehydrate really nicely, um, but uh, they, they have a, a unique sugary taste. Uh, and in some cases, sometimes there's kind of a, a little bit of a, a tart apple-y aftertaste, apple-y or, or uh, almost prune-like. Um, so very unique. Uh, it's nice because they are pest free or nearly pest free, which is, is kind of wonderful uh, because you, you think about a lot of other fruit varieties and, and, uh, and the pest list can, can be pretty long. But this one, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the traditional fruit pests just don't know what it is. Um, so Lee and Lang are kind of the two recommended varieties. 
Uh, and uh, cocoa is, is one that is unique because it does have a coconut-like taste. Um, there are other varieties out there that, that also do well around here. Uh, so it's, it's definitely worth a try. A lot of the rest of the world knows this plant, but it's, it's one that has not been grown uh, in the States like apples or peaches even. Um, so, but it's definitely worth a try. All right, so now we are getting into, we're getting into the berries and the small fruits. And uh, so if, if you can't stick around for berries and small fruits, I'm sorry, I know it's one o'clock now, we'll try to have this wrapped by 1.30. Uh, so, so berries and, and small fruits, we're just going to talk about kind of the, the same thing with the trees, you know, good growing sites, uh, the, the good varieties, uh, proper planting, and a little bit about maintenance, but because it's going to be so many different crops, we won't get into all of that. Uh, we're mainly going to talk about some of these varieties that grow really well around here. So basically with the berries, it's kind of the same as the trees. You want full sun, <clears throat> you want good soil, uh, you definitely want good drainage. And, and that's probably more true of some of these berry species than of fruits um, because they, they just don't like wet feet. They, they will rot out very quickly. So we'll, we'll look at kind of some of the fruit quality and characteristics. We'll look at pollination, although pollination for berries uh, in some cases can actually be very easy when you think about raspberries and blackberries. You put a plant out there and it's, and it's self-fertile. So it's, it's not that much of an issue. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about some of these. Uh, we'll also uh, want to mention that so we do offer for sale, and, and once our cool season plants go on sale, we'll be offering uh, bare root blackberries, bare root raspberries, and bare root strawberries. And so uh, that's something that, that you'll want to know how to plant these bare root plants. Um, so basically, this is what it'll look like. You'll, you'll get this, and this looks like a raspberry right here. Uh, so, so you'll get this thing that's uh, a bunch of roots and a and a stick, and it, and and here's a here's a white shoot coming out of it. So, so basically you'll you'll get this and you'll you'll want to plant this pretty much right away. Um, the other thing that I think is is very key with some of these raspberries, especially, is uh, making sure well raspberries and blackberries is making sure the roots do not dry out in the process and also with raspberries cutting back uh, the stem so cutting back the woody stem and here you see you have this nice white new shoot coming out you would just cut the stem back to right above that shoot uh, oftentimes uh, with when you do that that'll help instigate more growth uh, so so you're helping wake the plant up uh, very early so just like uh, just like the trees, you know, it's kind of proper depth. Uh, you'll want to spread the roots out. Uh, really, you're you're not digging very deep at all on these. If anything, uh, four to six inches deep at the most. And then you'll be spreading the roots out laterally and then uh, watering. So this is kind of a, a little bit of a. Uh, it's not only. Uh, how to how to plant, or a little bit of uh, what it looks like once planted, but also a little bit about cane biology. And this, in particular, is with a a blackberry, um, because uh, with with blackberries, they actually have two different stages of canes. So uh, blackberries can be considered they are basically a perennial crop with biennial canes. Meaning they're perennial, they're going to come back year after year after year, but each one of the, the canes has sort of a two-year life cycle. 
So if, if you look on this, you see the first year canes. These are ones that just emerged. They, they came out this spring, we'll say. And here you have the second year cane, the flowering cane. This was something that came out last spring to early summer. Now this year it's flowering and fruiting. So what happens once it is flowered and fruited is that cane actually starts to die and you end up cutting that cane back. Now we, we're getting into maintenance a little bit here and we'll, we'll talk more extensively at another one of our workshops, but that's something that you kind of need to know uh, especially with your brambles, with your uh, with your blackberries, especially raspberries, not so much. Although uh, there are a lot of varieties of raspberries out there. And speaking of, so here we are uh, looking at raspberries, and there are a lot out there. So. Um, they're, they're, they're nice golden raspberries like Anne. Uh, they're they're the, the red raspberries that most of us know. And, and uh, Caroline is the one that we love. It's the one that we sell. It's a nice big berry. It's a firm berry. It produces from late July all the way to our first hard freeze. As a matter of fact, the frost, you know, the berries are still ripening. Uh, I don't know how many times I've, I've gone in and harvested berries after a first frost and they're still still producing. It's a hard freeze that really will knock the plant back. Um, and then there are yellow raspberries, there are purple raspberries and, and uh, black raspberries. And, and black raspberries are kind of a separate animal because they're, they're a, an entirely separate species and, and have a very distinct taste. Um, so unpacking all of this can, can be a little bit of a challenge, but it can be very rewarding. You know, you have to have to learn about primocanes and you have to learn about floricanes. Now, th those are basically words saying that primocane means that it produces on a first year cane. So like our Caroline raspberries, they emerge in March with new shoots they fruit from the end of July until our first hard freeze. So those are primocanes. They do it all in one year. They go through the cycle. And then you cut them down, they'll do the same thing the next year, the next year. Something that is floricane, however, means it produces, like I did, said on the last slide there with the blackberries, it produces canes one year and those canes will fruit that next year. So that's kind of a little bit of uh, cane biology and variety selection all in one. Blackberries, there is also a lot out there as well, but not nearly as much. And, and uh, I'm always amazed at how many people think, well, blackberries are thorny. Well, yeah, I mean, back in the day, uh, but there's been a lot of breeding that's gone on uh, on thornless blackberries and, and breeding uh, larger berry thornless blackberries, breeding sweeter thornless blackberries. And so there's a lot out there. The nice thing about thornless blackberries is it makes blackberry maintenance blood free. Uh, yeah, sure, the blood might make the berries taste sweeter, but uh, but I don't know. It it can be it can be really tough when you're trying to manage a an old thorny blackberry patch. And so the variety that that we sell and that we really like is Natchez. Uh, they ripen in mid June to July. But there are a lot of other uh, varieties out there that are worth trying. Now I will say if uh, if you plant blackberries, uh, you should plan on putting them on a trellis or building a trellis for them. I know many people say, oh, I'm just gonna put them along my fence. Well, okay, you're putting them along a chain link fence. They're going to grow through the chain link fence. But the thing is with these, you have to manage the canes and you have to cut the dead out. And so it, once they get into a fence, it, becomes a little bit more difficult to manage them that way. 
the, the way we like to manage them is uh, with a clothesline type T style trellis. And, and that way it makes it really easy to just uh, tie the canes up to the trellis line, makes it easy to harvest. It also makes it easy to maintain. So uh, when considering blackberries, do consider a, a trellis-like structure and don't just plant them along a fence thinking, oh, well, they're just gonna grow along a fence. I mean, sure they will, but you won't be able to get the same amount of production and then managing them is going to be you know, that, that much more onerous. So, so give them a little bit of thought. Okay, let's talk strawberries a little bit. Because uh, strawberries is another thing that we sell and they do incredibly well around here. And let's talk a little bit about strawberry biology. Some these day root neutrals uh, versus June bearing strawberries. So it's basically kind of two different types. Uh, June bearing, and actually they're more kind of May June bearing for us around here. Uh, so they they will send out a, a, a blossoms and a flush of berries that will happen in May and June. And then, you know, then they then they're just vegetative growth for the rest of the year. They're they're putting on they're putting on new daughter plants uh, and then they'll produce again next year. Day neutral and or ever bearing, because sometimes this is a synonymous term, um, they actually produce three different crops uh, in the year. And so uh, day neutral has its first big spring flush, which is kind of that May, June time frame, And then you'll have smaller crops that will happen again in July and then again in mid-September. And these are definitely a smaller crop in July and September, but you know it can be kind of nice to have some strawberries right at the end of the season. Uh, it does make for a nice treat. Um, but you know there are advantages to June bearing. There are advantages to ever bearing. Um, one of the things ab ab about the ever bearing is uh, it becomes harder to uh, maintain the, the fertility on them because all they're doing is just trying to pump out fruit. And so the plant suffers. And so you really have to fertilize uh, your, your berries a little bit more. Um, and if, if not properly maintained, the patch could actually burn out or, or die out uh, after a few years. Now, uh, the June bearing, the, the plants are very robust. And they they put the the mother plants put out lots of daughter plants. Those are the runners that keep growing and growing. And after a while, those daughter plants, all those mothers and daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters, well, all of a sudden you have a huge mass of plants. And so you do need to get in there and you need to thin out the older plants, the, the, the mothers and the grandmothers every couple of years uh, on your June bearing strawberries. So that's, that's kind of, you know, they, like I say, they, they both have some positives and some negatives. Here's a little bit about planting strawberries. Um, so uh, when, when you get your strawberries, you see they, they uh, look, uh, you know, they have tons of fibrous roots on them. You can, you can see those roots and then you can see the crown of the plant there. So you'll, uh, with June bearers, you'll wanna have them uh, kind of 12 to 18 inches, sometimes 12 to 24 inches on center uh, in a bed. And raised beds are actually really nice. Uh, one, you're not bending over as much to pick strawberries. And strawberries really need good drainage. So, so having strawberries just straight in the ground uh, can be problematic for, for a couple of different reasons. Um, but then uh, these day neutral and ever bearing, uh, they need to be planted a little bit tighter on center because the plants themselves are not nearly as robust uh, as the June bearing. Uh, the other thing is, if you're just planting uh, right in early spring, uh, let's say you get some, some berries from us, um, you would need to pinch those flower buds uh, first thing. 
that way you're encouraging vegetative growth. Uh, you're, you're letting that patch get established. And the same is true with the, uh, the day neutrals, pinch those first spring flower buds, but then you could allow them to fruit in the summer. And then here we have uh, sort of the proper planting diagram. And you'll see that uh, here it's planted too shallow, here it's planted too deep, and here Goldilocks is planted it. It's just right. So uh, just make sure that you have that crown just right at soil level. You don't have a bunch of exposed roots and you're not burying the, the plant. All right, a little bit about blueberries. Uh, of course, we, we don't offer blueberry plants here. Uh, and and we, we rarely, rarely plant blueberries with some of our giving grove sites. Uh, because there, there are some maintenance considerations uh, to take into account when you, when you do plant these. Uh, but they can be very rewarding. It's a very helpful fruit uh, once you get it established. So uh, the thing about blueberries is, is they need a soil pH of a 4.5 to a 5 or a 5.5. Five. So our soil around here is a seven to a seven five. In some cases, we have soils that are actually as low as six or six five, but it's it's fairly rare to find those type of soils around here. So what that means is if you were to just plant a blueberry plant in a, a 7.0 pH, that blueberry plant would just kind of sit there and it would not grow. And then it would start exhibiting different nutrient deficiencies and it just won't grow and then it'll get different cankers and then it'll finally die. So uh, in order to have a healthy plant, you do need to adjust the pH. And oftentimes that is done uh, by adding a whole bunch of peat to the soil uh, in combination with adding soil sulfur uh, to the area that you're going to plant. So uh, with that done, then you'd want to go ahead and take a, a, a pH reading. And, and sometimes you could just do this with a, a little pH test kit. Um, and if, if you're at that sweet, that sweet spot, or rather that sour spot uh, with your soil, uh, then, then you could go ahead and plant. Now, that said, you will still need to adjust your soil probably on an annual basis by adding sulfur. But once you have your soil right, uh, it, it, that, that helps immensely and, and then your plants will grow and they'll start fruiting. So in general, you'll need two different uh, varieties for pollination. You will need good drainage. You don't want these standing in water. Uh, and you will want mulch as well. So a good wood chip mulch, or in some cases, pine needle mulch, uh, which is acidic and will help bring the pH down. But that mulch will, will help keep uh, sort of even moisture on your plants. Uh, the other thing about blueberries, because they, the root system is very different than uh, many of the other plants, that, many of the other fruiting plants that we deal with, they don't have a very strong root system. Uh, it's not very fibrous. Uh, and, and so the, the roots can dry out quickly. And so having supplemental irrigation, especially if, if your plants are kind of planted uh, away from the house, uh, is going to be key. So having a drip irrigation that gets run you know, once a week, uh, probably at bare minimum, uh, is, is going to be much needed. And that will, that will ensure you have a, a healthy plant. And then there are a number of varieties that are nice and adaptable here. This is just a, a few of them, the, the Liberty, Reka, Duke, and Blue Crop. Uh, Blue Crop has just some, some great, great big berries um, and, and Duke does as well. So a little bit about grapes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of growing grapes around here so much because it is, it's really, it's, it's an onerous task. Uh, because we have such high humidity, 
uh, we have a lot of fungal problems with grapes. And so a lot of the, the seedless or table grapes are, are off the table. Uh, we, we can't grow them very effectively without, uh, without a barrage of different fungicides. So um, you still can grow grapes around here, but, uh, but finding ones that uh, have, are resistant to a lot of the fruit rots or the, uh, the leaf molds and, and funguses uh, is key. Uh, Concord, the, the seeded Concord, is, it definitely grows well around here. Norton, which is the uh, Missouri wine grape, uh, it grows beautifully. Uh, and, and you'll have more fruit than you know what to do with, and, and you could make wine out of it. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a rambunctious one and doesn't seem to get a lot of foliar uh, or fruit uh, rots or funguses. And then there are the Munson grape hybrids, and, and these Munson hybrids are, are ones that were uh, developed down in Arkansas. Uh, we have yet to trial any of those, but they are recommended for the more uh, warm and humid areas of the country. So it's something that's worth looking into. And then Traminette is, is just a, another wine grape. So can't really recommend table grapes. Service berry. Um, service berries are, are, there are a lot of native service berries out there. We have, have uh, one in Missouri, uh, Amalanker arborea, which is native in some of the wooded areas. Uh, they make a fine fruit. It's kind of similar to a blueberry, except it has a bunch of little seeds in it. But they, they are tasty. Um, there's the variety Autumn Brilliance, which is actually being used as a, sort of a street tree, uh, landscape tree. It's been, been used as that for quite a while now. Uh, and then there is the Stolonifera, um, which is also another actual native variety, which is the running service berry, it makes a great little hedge. And then Smokey and Tyson are, are some of the, uh, the shad blow service berries or the Saskatoons, which are more native to the Northeast and Canada. But there are, all of these are fairly well adapted, uh, nice and low maintenance. So, so you, you're not worrying about uh, sprays as much. Have some other small fruits here, the currants. And so there are a lot of currants out there, uh, red, black, pink, white. Uh, however, most of the varieties of currants are going to succumb to powdery mildew and they're not going to like our hot summers. And so that's something where I just can't recommend most currants that are out there on the market. Um, however, down below we have Crandall clove currant. And now this is, uh, it's, a, it's actually a native species. And the variety Crandall was one that was found, I believe, down in Newton, Kansas, back in, gosh, the late 1800s. This was one that was, was found um, growing. It exhibited large fruits. It exhibited copious amounts of fruits. And so from there, it's just been propagated and propagated. And you can see how many fruits, and those are a much larger current than, than a black or a red or a white current. Uh, so very productive, uh, very unique, almost Concord grape-like flavor. And uh, when they're in full bloom, the scent is absolutely intoxicating. Uh, I invite you guys to come here in April when our clove currants are in flower. It's, it's wonderful. Gooseberries, uh, those are also out there. And gooseberries and currants are closely related, uh, sort of superficially. Uh, one of the ways you can tell the difference is gooseberries have thorns, currants do not. So, so now, now you can talk about them and the, you know that they're separate species. Uh, gooseberries can do just fine around here. Uh, varieties like, like Pixwell uh, is, is, does about the best of any of them. Gooseberries are an acquired taste uh, because they have thorns. They're also kind of a, a little challenging that way. 
but uh, ones like 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 Pixwell um, do do the best. And then there's uh, ones uh, things like Hardy Kiwi. So these aren't the big fuzzy kiwis. These are these are um, basically a smaller, almost table grape sized fruit uh, when they fully mature. But they do taste like kiwis, and you can eat the skin on them. You just pop pop them right in your mouth. This is something that can grow well around here. They do need to have a trellis on them, um, but it, it's a crop that uh, right now it's, you know, not too many people are growing it and something that we're giving a try here. Um, so uh, it, it is definitely worth it. Um, you do need to have a male and female in order to ensure good fruit production. And then lastly, and some of these things I, I covered earlier. Um, so there are a lot of fruit plants out there and we've touched on some of them, um, but are they worth growing? And so we touched on persimmons. Cornelian cherry dogwood we didn't touch on and it, it's certainly worth growing if you have the space. Uh, hardy kiwis, we, we did touch on elderberry, we did not, and, and elderberry, uh, Missouri is the number one producer in the, in the United States of elderberry. Elderberries are a very healthful berry, they're used in a lot of uh, cough syrups, uh, jams and jellies, and very productive, easy to care for. Talked about blueberries, talked about currants and gooseberries. Grapes and plums, we did talk about those um and apricots mulberries we did not talk about mulberries you know mulberries are a weed in some cases everybody's fence line is filled with them uh the the white mulberry the the the, the asian the chinese mulberry is, is and and but then there are uh, other varieties like some of the dwarf mulberries and dwarf mulberries i think do have a have a niche uh out there because they don't get very big because you can harvest all of the fruits on them. So, so it's, uh, it's something that, that probably has a spot in the landscape. And then there's the aronia berry. Um, aronia berry, also known as chokeberry, uh, is something that, that we're growing around here. They are also a very healthful berry uh, used in a lot of, uh, a lot of juice blends. And the uh, the shrub itself is uh, is very attractive. Wonderful white blossoms, uh, nice dark purple berries. Now the other side here is the no save your money uh, because there are a lot of people that was like oh well I want to grow this 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 and this it looks good in the catalog and well so time out at Powell Gardens, I, I was there for a few years and planted a number of these things uh, in the Heartland Harvest Garden. And so it was kind of a, a trial balloon for, for some of these uh, plants, uh, like the sea berry. Sea berry is not really suited for our climate at all. Um, they, they have, uh, it's tough to get them established and then the heat and our clay soils, they don't like so much. So kind of not worth it. Uh, same with honeyberry. Well, honeyberry is very tasty. Uh, they just don't like our summers and they don't like our clay soils. Uh, medlars, which is kind of an unusual fruit. Uh, it's, it's almost lost to history out there, but uh, the, the fruit nerds, uh, I, I want to grow that. Uh, fire blight magnet. And so that's not something you'd want to introduce. Uh, same with some of the fruiting quinces, not something you'd want to uh, introduce to, to your landscape. Alpine strawberries. Uh, this kind of, you know, a lot of permaculturists uh, thought this was kind of going to be the, the darling ground cover. Well, they burn out too because we're not an alpine climate. And, and quite honestly, uh, the strawberries aren't that tasty, you know. If, if get a good June bearing variety, get uh, get an ever bearing variety. Those can be used for ground cover too, and they'll actually thrive a little bit better than alpine strawberries. 
nectarines you can grow, but really it's not worth the disease and fungus. Uh, nectarines, of course, are related to peaches, uh, but however, they they just you know peaches get disease funguses and insects. Nectarines get them twofold. So uh, in my mind, not worth it. Autumn olive. Uh, it's an invasive species. It may be edible, but it's invasive. So that's just be responsible. Don't don't plant a an, a, a species that's going to start taking over uh, our our own ecological niche here in in the Midwest. Um, Gumi, which is related to autumn olive, is is possibly invasive. And so uh, that's something that I I also would not recommend planting. And then finally, goji berry. Uh, yeah, they're they're healthy, um, but so are so many of these other fruits. Goji berry also has kind of a sort of mm, rotten tomato type flavor that I can't get into, um, and it can possibly be invasive. I have noticed it growing in some some rather strange places that it shouldn't be uh, around the metro here. You know, I think goji berry has a place in certain per permaculture systems or in certain farms, but I would say around here, it's, it's probably best not planted. So I think with that, uh, that really should wrap things up. Um, so yeah, come out and visit us here. Uh, come to the demonstration orchard. Uh, and that's, that's what you see here that Actually, it's not in this photo, it's not fully planted, but uh, it is fully planted now. So you can come see a lot of these fruit plants, uh, fruiting shrubs, trees, et cetera. Uh, hopefully you found this helpful in, in deciding what you want to plant. Um, and uh, with that, do we have any questions? Uh, we do not have any questions, Matt, um, but I was going to let everybody know. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, okay. Well, the, let, me, let me stop sharing here, or did I stop? I yeah, you did. And actually, there is one question um, in the chat, if you just want to go ahead and look at the chat, if you can. Okay, so the pollination requirements, are there any recommendations for the distance between placements between two varieties? Uh, any recommendations for where to buy good cherry trees? So there's a, okay. So so first off, on the uh, the the pollination distance, um, oftentimes you know a half block. If if we're thinking about measuring in sort of city distances, uh, you know two to three hundred yards, the pollination will still happen. Uh, so so you can be that far away. Um, uh, or you could have them right next to one another. So, so pollination uh, is, yeah, you can, you, you, in general, you don't have to worry as long as you have two different varieties. Any recommendations on where to buy good cherry trees? Uh, so I guess it depends on the cherry, but uh, I, would, I would look, uh, um, you know, locally, sometimes the nurseries, some of the local nurseries, uh, get in some good varieties, soil service being one of them. Sometimes Suburban does as well. Uh, online, uh, I would suggest maybe Cummins Nursery. They're out of New York. I would also look at One Green World. I would look at um, Rain Tree Nursery, and both of those are up in the Northwest. And, ah, yeah, yeah. So, and then suggestions for protecting fruit trees from animals the first two years. Well, you know, that depends on the animals because um, deer can, can just ruin uh, fruit trees, uh, not only by nibbling them back all the time, uh, uh, but also the young bucks uh, will end up uh, rubbing their antlers on the trunks and so then, then the tree's dead after they've girdled the tree. Uh, so sometimes caging trees uh, can be very, very important. Um, sometimes uh, just having some trunk protectors on the trees can help 
because I mean, there's there's all sorts of fauna out there that will be going after your trees. Uh, so not only the trees themselves, but then the the fruit once you get there. So that's uh, it's almost like that's a whole separate class there. Um, but but caging for deer. Uh, or fencing if you can, trunk protectors for things like rabbits. And then as the, as the fruit, uh, fruit trees get to be older, uh, uh, putting something like a baffle, uh, be it sheet metal or some sort of uh, something that will, will keep the squirrels from climbing up into the trees. Um, so that, uh, that's just okay we've got another question here thank you do you recommend using a root stimulator before planting no not really um so if anything uh you know make sure that the the, the roots if it's a bare root uh make sure that they're they're moist um then another thing that that is sometimes recommended is uh mycorrhizal fungus and that's something that, that can be purchased at a lot of different nurseries. So mycorrhizal fungus, it, it works with the root system, uh, attaching itself to the roots and kind of extending the root system uh, out into the ground. Uh, so that's recommended. In some cases, you may need to add a little bit of uh, phosphorus in the form of bone meal uh, because a lot of our soils are low on phosphorus. Um, so root stimulator, I'm not kind of the, uh, you know, I, I haven't, haven't drank the Kool-Aid on that one. Um, and let's see, do you plant out all fig, okay, um, yes, we have. So, so the fig varieties that we listed, I believe, uh, Peter's Honey, Harvey Chicago, and Stella, uh, yes, yes, they all do come back after the winter. And the, the thing about that is, uh, and, and in some cases, we, we, don't, uh, we don't winterize the figs at all. We just, you know, we let them go dormant. They stay there on the landscape. However, uh, a lot of it also has to do on the timing on when the figs have been planted. So here at, uh, at KCCG and out in the Beanstalk, we have six, seven, maybe eight varieties of fig out there, uh, they all come back for us. So, um, but, but we make sure we plant them once the soil's warmed up. So typically May, June, and then they have plenty of time to get their roots out into the ground. These are all varieties that, uh, they're kind of known varieties that are uh, winter hardy. Whether or not they're going to produce a lot is kind of a, another story. All right, I think that might be all the questions. I believe so, yeah. And I just wanted to share uh, something with everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, if you want to see a recording of this presentation, um, you can go to our website. Um, kccg.org and then underneath the resources, how to videos, and then virtual workshops right here. Um, right now we have up still all of our two, 2021 uh, workshops that are just YouTube embeds here, but I'll get this presentation up along with the PowerPoint um, PDF download. Um, I should have it up either today or by Monday. Um, I think Matt mentioned also, we still have some fruit trees available to order. Uh, if you go to our store, fruit trees and berries uh, link here, it has all the pricing information, how to order, and then some information on our fruit trees. And then uh, I should mention, I guess our berry plants will go on sale for green cards on March 24th and all cards are on March 25th. So the strawberries and blackberries and raspberries will be included in that, along with our cool season plants. So um, that's all I have. All Does right, anybody well, have any other questions? Yeah, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see many of you uh, in two weeks for our fruit tree maintenance workshop. And then I believe, is it a week after that is our hands-on pruning workshop. 
Yeah, I believe that's correct. <clears throat> um, and we got one more question here. Um, yeah, our, our fruit order form does, does have what is available. So once you go through the, the fruit order form link uh, and enter your membership information and all that, it will have everything that we still have available. Yeah, and I, I can pull up the list right now. It looks like we still have Liberty Apple, Pristine Apple. We have Tojuro Asian Pear, Korean Giant Asian Pear. And I think we have a few European pears left as well. So unfortunately, we're, it is kind of slim pickings right now. So yeah, we have, we have the Blake's Pride and Haro Delight and Warren European Pear also. We're sold out of peaches and cherries though. Sorry about that. Yeah, those go quick. All right. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for attending, everybody. And uh, we look forward to having you. Oh, wait, one more, one more question. <laughs> ah. Yeah, I would go ahead and order on the very first day. Just be on the lookout on our website. We announce when uh, we, and it's generally February 1st is usually the first day every year, right, Matt? As long yeah. As long as yeah, day. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's generally February 1st. Yeah, we had uh, some technical difficulties the first couple of days. So the order didn't get up until I think the third. Uh, but yeah, yeah. And and I think everybody was just there reading to submit their order. So yeah, unfortunately, I think this is the quickest we've ever been sold out of this much this year. People were ready to plant. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thanks for attending, everybody, and uh, have a good weekend.